praise when I'm sure. I'll praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered. I'll praise when surrounded.
we pray praise your name praise your name God we give you our hearts this morning all consuming fire your our hearts desire living flame of love come baptize us come baptize us all consuming fire your our hearts desire living flame of love come baptize us come baptize us all consuming fire your our hearts desire Baptize us, come baptize us, and all consuming fire, your our heart's desire, living flame of love, come baptize us, come baptize us. Consuming fire, your our heart's desire, living flame of love. Come baptize us, come baptize us. All consuming fire.
We want more, we want more of you. We want more of you. Bless of us, oh God. Holy fire, burn away my desire for anything that is not of you and is of me. I want more of you and less of me. less like the world and to be more like you God to be more like your son Jesus to walk in a way that the, the kingdom of heaven is the priority in our hearts and we ask that you change us God many of us try to change our hearts and our minds but we need the Holy Spirit we thank you for that Thank you, God. We lift you up in this place. And we give you all the glory and honor this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey Mugzion, I'm Abdias, and let's get ready for some announcements. First thing we have is July 21st is Saima Sunday. It's Sunday, 11 a.m. Come out and see the visual arts and performance created by our Saima students. Email McKenna Bem for more information. Secondly, July 23rd, you belong. Pastor Devin and staff members sharing who we are, what we believe, membership, and how to get plugged in. Starting at 2.30 to 8 p.m. in the youth tent, dinner also we provided. Please register using the QR code. Next, July 24th, we will start to begin a six-week church-wide study on the Feast of the Lord, Discovering Christ in the Celebration. That would also be 7 to 8.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Contact Steve Presser for more information. Also, July 26th, WOW! Israel Gathering will be 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. I've set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. Contact Leah for more information. Lastly, we have the 28th of July, reception for Amanda Davis, following the 11 a.m. service in the youth tent, celebrating Amanda's years in the children ministry and her move to Mount Zion, Director of Operations. Now for the month of July as a whole, we have Mount Zion to West Virginia. We'll be holding a virtual back to school drive for the children of Warncliffe, West Virginia, School supplies, personal items, and school snacks can be purchased from our Amazon and Walmart wish lists and be shipped directly to the Blessing Barn in Warncliffe. Our volunteer in West Virginia, Janet Gibson, will then distribute the school supplies to our children, and you can register using the QR code down below. All right, guys, for those are announcements, and I hope you guys get ready and renew your minds for the sermon. I hope you guys have a great day, and remember, Jesus loves you. See you guys. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good to see you. I know this is the nine o'clock service, but I think we can do a little bit better than that. How's everyone doing this morning? All right, good to see you all. My name is Devin Peterson. I'm the pastor here, and I just would love to and uh, just welcome you. If this is your first time with us, you may have gotten a brochure on your way in. I always call it a brochure, a bulletin, a bulletin on your way in with a connection card on one side. I encourage you to fill that out so we can get better connected with you. Um, we've got a lot going on, as you saw in our announcement video. One thing I just want to highlight real quick, who was here last Sunday night, joined us last Sunday night? We had just an incredible time. Yeah, give it up. We had just an incredible time of worship and prayer, and I would like to invite you to come back tonight. We're going to do a similar format where we just continue to pray for the Holy Spirit to bring a fresh outpouring because we know that the world that we live in, we need God to move in a big way, right? As we saw some of the events yesterday uh, with the assassination attempt on Donald Trump, listen, I don't care where you stand politically. What took place yesterday was absolutely inexcusable. It was corrupt and it was wrong. And I want to just join together as a body of believers right now as we pray for unity in our nation. You know, if you think about our Pledge of Allegiance, that we are one nation under God, indivisible. If you were to remove that piece that says under God, then we're one nation indivisible, which our history tells us is not true. We've been divided many times. We're divided today. We have to be under God in order for us to be united. We have to stand firm on truth under that banner of truth for us to be a nation that's united. So could you stand with me as we stand in, in, in unity today, praying for our nation? And again, it doesn't matter where you stand politically. We are all in the same nation, and we need to lift our leaders and our future up to the hands of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now, and we pray for unity in our nation. Lord, I pray that you would help us to put aside petty differences that cause division, and you would help us to focus on the future of our nation, the future of our nation being a nation under God. 
Lord, we settle for nothing less than for us to be built on the foundations of Scripture, on the foundations of a Judeo-Christian ethic that is the foundation of a, of a civilized culture. I pray right now that you would bring the right leaders into our nation to lead us into all that you have for us. Lord, I believe that you have a hand in the process of the selection of, of leadership, and I pray right now that you would influence those who are decision makers so that we have a bright future ahead of us. I pray for unity in our nation, that these types of uh, corrupt, just absolutely ridiculous acts of violence would be stopped in the name of Jesus. We thank you for protection. And Lord, I pray for the families of those who have lost a loved one or who have gone through a difficult situation because of what took place yesterday. I pray that you'd bring peace to their lives and that you would help them to know that you're not a far off distant God, but you're right in the middle, bringing peace and healing to those who call on your name. I pray that you would just continue to sustain us as we move forward as a nation and that we would please and honor you in everything that we do. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have a seat. Well, we are continuing our study on the book of Acts, and I've asked Steve Presser to share with us today. So, Steve, if you'll come on up. Steve is going to be sharing a little bit on the feasts that we find from the, from the Jewish culture. And one of the reasons why this is important for the book of Acts is because you'll realize as we go through this book how much of a Jewish influence there is in this book and how important it is for us to understand what was happening in the background. We talked about Pentecost just last Sunday. It was a, it was a Jewish feast to understand what really took place there. You have to understand why they were celebrating in the first place. So Steve's going to be giving this introductory sermon today, uh, and then he's going to be doing a church-wide study starting on the 24th, the Feast of the Lord, and I encourage you to come be a part of that. I I've learned a lot just from hearing uh, what he has planned, and I encourage you to be a part of it. So I just want to say a word of prayer over Steve this morning as we get started, and I'll turn it over to him. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Steve. I thank you for the, the, the gift of wisdom and knowledge that you've given him. I thank you that you have paved the way as he has studied this content. I pray that the anointing would come on him today as he preaches your word. I pray that our hearts would be open to receive all that you want to share with us today. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, well, it's good to be with you. And, uh, yeah, and also, I heard it. And also with you. I heard it. I heard it out there. That makes my old Lutheran heart happy. Um, <laughs> May the fourth be with you. Um, so yes, we are, uh, we are fired up. We are ignited. Uh, this is an exciting time, an exciting season here in our church. And as Pastor Devin said, we're going through the book of Acts, and we felt it was fitting and appropriate to kind of revisit these ideas of the feast. Last week, we started off with Acts chapter 1 and 2, and we saw the introduction, as you, as you might recall, of in Acts chapter 2 specifically, that Holy Spirit being poured out onto the people and in some ways, some great confusion. Peter uses that opportunity to correct some false assumptions about drunkenness within the people and says, no, 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 what you're actually seeing is not an outpouring of intoxication, but an overwhelming outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the believers and the church. And so what I want us to do is, as we begin to understand what Pentecost is, that was the festival that was taking place at the time, I want us to revisit Acts chapter 2, and just put the context in front of us once again uh, as we get into this. So if you have your Bible and you want to open it, um, I'm going to read just portions of this. We'll have it on the screen for you. Uh, so starting in Acts chapter 2, and what I, want you to what I want you to do is to try to, and I'll try to emphasize as I read, I want to try to emphasize a few of the key words that we'll see have relevance as we go through today's message. So it says in chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. So keep that in your mind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And there were divided tongues of fire that appeared to them and rested on them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own language? 
Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, uh, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors of Rome. Both Jews and proselytes, that'd be converts. Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own language, in our own tongues, the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed. Have you ever been amazed and confused at the same time? Saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking them said, they are filled with new wine. Now, what we're going to skip here is the portion that we read last week of Peter's actual sermon. He corrects them to say they're not drunk with wine as you suppose, but this was the promise that was poured out. And he goes in to speak about Joel and a couple of the others who foretold of the coming promise of the Holy Spirit. In verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, this was the people that Peter was speaking to, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? How are we to respond to all this? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, everyone to whom the Lord calls. And with that or excuse me, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, so he kept on preaching, And he said to them, save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added about 3,000 souls that day. Now that's a lot of information to kind of keep in the back of your head. But the first thing that we see when we read this Acts story is specifically that all this took place at Pentecost. At Pentecost. So if you're someone who's quickly reading through the scriptures and you read that, you might, have a, you might have no frame of reference, really, as to what Pentecost is. And we want to spend some time this morning unpacking what that festival, what that feast really is, and see how all the details tie into what we just read. Because they are important. And I think what they'll do is it will open your eyes all the more to how God is in each of the mundane details Of our life. So, to do this, we're going to start. If you want a full account and reading of all the feasts of the Lord, you can turn to Leviticus 23. And a lot of people who start to read the Bible from cover to cover, this is usually the book that they give up on. And it's sad um, because it can be a bit wordy, a little confusing. Um, We just don't understand in our day and time a lot of the cultural things that were taking place in this day and time. And so, I want us to go to Leviticus 23 because it's here that we see the largest um, text as it pertains to the Feast of Pentecost, or sometimes known as um, the Feast of Weeks. So in verse 15 of chapter 23, try to stay with me here, he says, you will count seven full weeks from that day after the Sabbath. So he's talking about the Sabbath celebration day of the previous feast, which would be the Feast of Firstfruits. Uh, The Feast of first fruits. So on that day, you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. So one of the things to keep in mind is that a lot of these, well, really all these festival seasons, they also tended to be surrounded by the harvest seasons, whether that be in the early spring, the early summer, or the fall time. So you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made with two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour. They shall be fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. That's an important piece, with leaven this time, as a first fruit to the Lord. You shall present the seven, or you shall present the bread, seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd, and two rams. They shall be burnt offerings to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings. That's an important piece, too. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, 
Let's see. And their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma. You shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice for a peace offering. The priest shall wave the brim, shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. You shall make proclamation on that same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And so, in other words, this is to be a true holiday. If the day happened to fall on anything other than Saturday, it would have been treated all the same as a Sabbath day. He goes on that you shall, do, you shall not do any ordinary work. It's a statue forever in your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap right up to the edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings for your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Now, if you got a little lost in all that reading, here's a recount. They're to wait for 50 days, seven weeks plus one. They're to bring a grain offering of new grain. Specifically, it was a long leavened loaf of bread, two of them, to the, te- to the temple for sacrifice, along with a host of other animals to include seven lambs, one bull, two rams, a male goat, and two male lambs, specifically as a sin and a peace offering. That's a lot. That's a lot. And so with this, then, there's to have no ordinary work. It's treated as a Sabbath day. And the Feast of Weeks, like I said, it's one of three of these festival seasons. So the first festival season in the springtime would have included uh, the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and also with it, then, the Feast of First Fruits. So that would have been in the spring. You count those seven weeks or those 50 days, and you get to a one-day celebration, which is the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, as we know today. Fast forward then to the fall season, and within a 15-day time frame, you're going to have three more feasts. You're going to have um, Rosh Hashanah, the the, the Jewish New Year, the Feast of Trumpets. You're also going to have with it then, um, uh, you have trumpets, and then Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And then finally, you're going to have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is when they dwelt in tents. So why is all of this so important? It's important because as we read... One of the other things that they were told to do is to leave the edges of the field. And this served as somewhat of a welfare program, if you will, not only for the poor who lived in that area, but as you read the text, you had people coming from all different nations to celebrate this festival. And the reason why is because every male Jew, every believer, was required to attend each of these three festival seasons. Now with this is the the fact that the names are important. The names are important. So in the, in the Hebrew, you have three separate names that identify this festival. I am not the best at enunciating these things. Um, but the first one, <clears throat> the first one, excuse me, was um, Hag Hashavut, which means the Feast of Weeks. And it specifically talks about the counting of the time. The next one is Yom Habikurim, which means Day of First Fruits. So that's not to be confused with the Feast of First Fruits. That was a feast all unto itself in the springtime. This now is a second First Fruits holiday, if you will, because they were to bring now not just the barley harvest, but now the wheat harvest. And so you have a day of First Fruits. The third one is Hag Hakatsir, and that is the Feast of the Harvest, as we kind of just talked about. And what it did is it was the official beginning of the summer harvest season. And so the Hebrew term for this festival is Shavuot. And when that got translated into the Greek, they looked back to that festival of seven weeks or 50 days, and that's where we get penta, meaning five or 50, Pentecost. And so as we celebrate it on this side of history, we call it Pentecost because of just that. Now in the Old Testament, there's about three scriptures, one of which we read, and there's two others. One's found in Numbers 28, and the other is found in Deuteronomy 16 that specifically talk about how the Feast of um, Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, is specifically to be celebrated. Outside of that, it's really just customs and traditions that educate us today as to how this feast was celebrated. But we also know that the feast was celebrated much like the first Feast of First Fruits. And what I mean by that is whatever they were bringing into the harvest, they could not partake of those items until they first were presented and offered as sacrifices in the temple. Pentecost is also a dateless holiday. So where Passover, feast of, um, the, the Feast of First Fruits, and uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they all are given a specific date. 
in which they are to begin. And Pentecost is the only one that does not have an actual date. So that's kind of a unique and important point. And you say, well, why is that so important? Well, if there was a hard and fast date, it'd be very tempting to set that date aside and just neglect the purpose for which you're counting. So in a fast-paced world like we have today, we oftentimes do that. We look at our calendar and we say, well, what's the next holiday? What's the next holiday? And I remember when I was a kid, um, you know, growing up in school, when Christmas time came, we, they'd, we'd be sent home for Thanksgiving, right? When we come back, we would count how many days until Christmas break. And one of the things that we did, and I see some school teachers in here, uh, ki- people who work with our kids, one of the crafts that we would do is we would take strips of paper, colored paper, and we would um, make a circle, put some glue on there, and then we'd get another one and make a chain. And every day that the classmates would come in, we would tear off one of those pieces of that chain, counting down then to the holiday. But what also did that represent? It meant we were that much further removed from the previous holiday. And that's exactly what the whole point of counting the Omer, which is what this was all about. So they would look back to the Feast of First Fruits. They would have this wave offering before the Lord of the Barley Harvest. And so they would count up to the fifty. Counting the Omer is the counting up into the 50th day, which was a dateless holiday. And it was a way to continuously remind them for the point and purpose for which they are about to celebrate. Given their agricultural culture then too, it was also a way for them to keep in mind where they were in the growing season. And so all of these things play a role, and it's very, very important. It helps to put skin on this whole story as we see this Pentecost story come to life. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that there was two leavened loaves that were brought as wave offerings to the Lord. Um, If you go back and look at Leviticus 23, 17, we saw that the bread was to be made with wheat. That was the harvest crop of the time. It was also to be made with leaven. That was important because we know that leaven, it permeates and it sours the bread to make it rise. So they were to bring these leavened loaves and they were also to be made with fine flour. And so the bread then would be waved as a first fruits offering to the Lord. And you might say, well, why waved? Why not put on the altar and burn like all the other animals? And the reason for that is because in Leviticus 2.1, it strictly forbids the leaven to touch the altar. And so because of that, they were waved. Now the next logical question is, well, why just two loaves? Why not one loaf? Why not three or four or some other number? Why two? And a lot of the scholars have kind of talked about this, and the biggest thing that I've been able to take away is that the number two has been consistent throughout the Scripture in terms of witnesses. Witnesses. So keep this in mind. It, was, it took two witnesses. Two witnesses were necessary for you to take someone to court. That's in Deuteronomy 19.15. You couldn't bring an accusation against an elder in the New Testament church without two witnesses. Jesus sent the disciples, his witnesses, two by two. When Jesus was transfigured before the disciples, there was two with him, Moses and Elijah. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. And what did Jesus say? He said that the the law and the prophets, what? Testify to me. You also see that there there will be two witnesses against the Antichrist, And so without the witnesses, you merely just have an opinion. And so the the waved bread offering, it accompanied many other sacrifices, including what was called peace offerings. And so the bread serves as a witness of sorts to the sacrifices that were being brought. So many scholars and teachers believe that the two loaves are actually symbols as we look at the Jews and the Gentiles together, people who were Jews from birth, people who were converts, as together with their leaven loaves, the sin that's within them, together they come before the temple, they come before God, and they're lifted up as witnesses for him. And so that's the point of the two loaves, is that they serve as witnesses to the sacrifice, witnesses to the peace offering, the peace offering we know today as Jesus Christ. And just like them, we come with our sin. We come with leaven in our own hearts, both Jews and Greeks alike. And we, we are witnesses of the work of Christ in his atoning death 
and sacrifice. Pretty cool stuff. I like this stuff. I uh, hope you do too. Now, one of the things that we read in the story is, this is the 9 o'clock service, so you'll appreciate this. They were complaining about, these were the, the Jewish people, the you know, Pharisees, Sadducees, critics of what was going on in the day. And they said, look at what's going on here. These guys must be drunk with new wine. And Peter stands up and he says to them, don't be so foolish. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. So we have about what, 200, 300 people here this morning. I can't imagine that too many of you woke up first thing in the morning and got anything other than a cup of coffee or a cup of juice. And so Peter uses this to correct something. So I want to walk us through this celebration. Pentecost is a festival. It was a festival, a joyous festival. And while, yes, they would be bringing their sacrifices and many things, one of the other things that they would do is celebrate. And people celebrate in many different ways. And they would celebrate with food and drink. It was just the custom and the culture of their day. It was probably seen more of the norm than the exception to the rule. And so in Acts 2.13, they're mocked because of the working of the Spirit taking place before them. Um, people of all different languages were hearing their own language in, the, in their tongues. And Peter tells them, don't be so ridiculous. Um, this is not drunkenness. Now, obviously, in our culture today, even me standing on this pulpit and talking about something like beverage alcohol could be seen by some of you as a bit taboo. And I understand that. And I also understand that there has been great misuse of what the Bible oftentimes calls as the gift. There has been great misuse of alcohol by people, so much so that it has damaged and ruined families, marriages, friendships, etc. And so because of that, many have chosen to abstain. I've witnessed this even in my own family. But I can't, we can't go forward in understanding the history here without at least acknowledging the fact that this was a cultural norm in their day, that they would have celebrated the festival. And so uh, just to give you a little more unique and interesting things in church history, in 1869, there was a dentist and a practicing Methodist by the name of Thomas Bromwell Welsh. He strongly opposed the production, the distribution, and consumption of beverage alcohol, and he discovered a way to use the pasteurization process to make for non-alcoholic communion wine. So as the temperance movement grew, and the prohibition movements grew even after that, so did the desire for non-alcoholic communion wine because churches didn't want to offend their brother, obviously. And so lo and behold, in 1893, Welch's Grape Juice Company was formed. <laughs> for years and centuries, the Christian church has predominantly used true wine to celebrate the Lord's Supper. But it's understandable in light of how many times and how many ways it could have been abused. It's easily understandable how we have moved away from that into some of the celebrations held today. But like I said, for centuries it was seen as a blessing of God and, um, and often used in the church. With that too, is you, there's a powerful symbol that takes place within communion wine in that it has a bitter sweet taste. And it's a reminder for those who partake of it of the bitterness that our Lord suffered and that the cost of his life, he would give himself for us. But also it's a picture of the sweetness of the gift that we receive in his blood. And so when individuals have partaken of communion wine in that fashion, that's the point that they are taking in as they celebrate the Lord's Supper. All in all, there's about 247 references to alcohol in Scripture. About 40 of them are negative. There are warnings about drunkenness, the potential dangers of alcohol, how it can lead to brawling and those sorts of things. But there's also 145 positive comments. Um, it talks about the signs of God's blessing, its use in worship. And there's also about 62 neutral uh, comments in the Scripture's containing alcohols, people falsely being accused, as we saw here, vows of abstinence, uh, so on and so forth. And so whatever your persuasion is, um, my goal is not to persuade you to one persuasion or the other, but it's to simply point out the fact that if you can understand what was happening in the cultural time of the day, 
it will bring to light all the more Peter's argument in the moment. We all know that adult beverages can be a, a bit of a social lubricant, if you will. Uh, and so after a drink or two, tend to be, people tend to be more relaxed. They tend to loosen up and talk a little bit more. They might even laugh a little bit more. I remember when I served as a chaplain assistant in the Army, uh, I got assigned to a Catholic priest for a two-week rotation uh, when his chaplain assistant went on leave. So this was one of the other units in the Army. Um, his chaplain assistant was deployed for a year-long uh, tour. At the midway point, they sent him home. I was only there for nine months with the Special Forces, and so I, I endured the whole time. Well, I got assigned to this Catholic priest, and we would have to fly from Taji to Baghdad to Fallujah, about three or four places between Saturdays and Sundays, and do all these different services. And in his tradition, when they facilitate communion, you finish the cup. You do not waste the cup. And so it was really interesting that we would start this rotation about 6 in the morning. Our first service was somewhere around 8 o'clock, and we'd go from camp to camp. And, and usually about 4 in the afternoon or so, this older, kind of stodgy man suddenly loosened up. <laughs> and by the end of the day, when you would expect people to be tired, he was just a chatterbox. And um, so it was one of the good laughs that I got. But it, it tends to be a lubricant. Now, if you were to keep on going, as many of you probably know, if you were to keep on going, eventually you're going to begin to slur your speech. You might start to lose your motor function, and you might even intoxicate the body. And we all know that too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So when you think then of the events of Pentecost in the story of Acts chapter 2, it's easy to see a little bit how this chaotic scene of people hearing a foreigner speak their own language, even though it's unknown, the excitement and the celebration that was taking place, you can easily see then, in the midst of the celebration, why they, why they might say, you must be drunk with new wine. And Peter goes on to say, they're not drunk as you suppose. When you get drunk on beverage alcohol, what does it do? Eventually, it overtakes the body. If you're not in control, you're out of control. And what Peter goes on to say there is they're not full of wine. What they are full of is the Spirit. They're not overtaken by something that's going to cripple their body. They're overtaken by something that is going to fill their soul. That's the point that Peter is trying to make. And he would go on to speak to them. Luke, who writes this for us, talked about this, as did Matthew, in Luke chapter 5. So going back, Jesus is being criticized. Let's go to Luke chapter 5. Jesus is being criticized in this particular passage by ruling authorities and Jews. They come to him and ask him, why don't your disciples fast and keep from drinking? Like John's disciples. And his response in part is this little parable. And he says to them, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst, and the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. What is he trying to get at? The new wine must be put into a fresh wineskin. If you're going to make wine, put it into a wineskin. That wine, as it ferments, it's going to also have to take room to grow, and it will deteriorate whatever the holding vessel is. And if you have an old wineskin that was not properly cleansed and cleared out, it would eventually burst it open. What is he saying? Let's go to the next one. And no one after drinking old wine, so some of you might be wine drinkers, you know that the old wine is the good wine. No one after drinking old wine desires the new. What did Jesus do at the, at the wedding at Cana? The, the, the butler came forward and he said, most people serve the good wine first and the bad wine last, but you have saved the best for last. He says, no, that the old is good. And what he's doing is he's showing these, these Pharisees and others who are locked into their old religious system, he's saying, you desire the old because you say it's better. What Jesus is saying is that he's doing something completely new. With that then, when you go back to this, Acts chapter 2, what does Paul tell us? He says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If you're a new creation, a new wineskin, let's say, it's only going to be then that you're able to be filled with 
the Spirit of God, which oftentimes is symbolic of this pouring out of wine, a pouring out of his new spirit. If he is making you into a new vessel, you'll be prepared then to hold the new wine of the Spirit. That's part of the point he's trying to say. He's essentially preaching that the outpouring of the Spirit is present because you had prepared vessels ready to receive it. That's the part of the point in this celebration. And he goes on this long and lengthy sermon as a result of that to connect the dots for people on the Jesus that they crucified and showing them that this was indeed their promised Messiah. Now, there's some other connections that we're going to try to breeze through here. And that is, number one, is the connection to Moses. So the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, it did away in large part with um, the ability then to come forward with all of these sacrifices. So in A.D. 140, the Sanhedrin convened and decided that they wanted to shift the focus of the Feast of Pentecost, where the Feast of Pentecost was primarily surrounding the agricultural season and the bringing of the sacrifices, what they decided is, is that they were going to point backwards now to Moses, to a very familiar story. So when you look back at Moses' story, around 50 days after they left Egypt, they would be at Mount Sinai. And you can read this beginning in Exodus chapter 19. The giving of the law would be given about 50 days. So remember, penta means 50. Pentecost means 50. From when they left Egypt. And so many people will associate then the birth of Judaism, the giving of the law to Moses, with Pentecost. And what's so interesting about this then is that we celebrate today the, the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. And so we're going to see just a few examples. There's some striking similarities. And if you're a Jew at this time, at the Feast of Pentecost, and you're witnessing all these things take place and you're bewildered, you might have thought back to the time of Moses receiving the law. So if we have it available, I'm, I'm going to turn real quick to Exodus chapter 19. And, um, and just kind of, we'll see some of these similarities. Do we have that on screen? I thought I gave it to you guys. Yell at me, Paige, yes or no? Okay. Um, I'll read it to you. So it's going to be Exodus 19, 16 through 20. This is why I keep my Bible handy. So Exodus 19, this is when Moses goes before God on the mountain, um, looking at verse 16. And I want you once again to hear some of, the, some of the specifics and the details and think then what you heard about uh, the story on Pentecost. Now in part, on the morning, on the third day, there were thunders and lightnings. Thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled what took place at Pentecost then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God they took their stand at the foot of the mountain now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire the smoke of it went up like the like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly and as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder Moses spoke and God answered him in the thunder the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top, and Moses went up. So this is just a small portion of it. One of the other things that we're going to see later in the story is that because Moses was there for so long of a time, receiving the Ten Commandments and other instructions in the law, the people began to get restless. They made for themselves a golden calf, and as part of that, um, 3,000 of them were executed. And that's one of the similarities that we see in the story of Pentecost. We see, number one, that there's fire in both occasions. God came down in a singular pillar of fire to Moses. God, the Spirit, came down and separated tongues of fire on all those believers at Pentecost. We see noises. We see wind. We saw that God himself came down. In Pentecost, for the New Testament, we see that God himself comes down. God, the Holy Spirit, comes down. The rabbis suggested during all this time that when the law went forward, it went forward in roughly 70 different languages. That was um, something that they would, would teach over the years. In the New Testament, we see that people from many languages and cultures came together and they heard in their own language the other's believers speaking. 
And we also see that at the giving of the law, 3,000 men were slain under Moses' day. And yet at the giving of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, 3,000 were saved that very day. And so where the law reveals sin, which condemns, the Spirit reveals the Savior and brings life. Whoa. So this is something that has happened in light of the temple being destroyed. And it's amazing for us as Christians, you know, the Lord has revealed this to us and opened our eyes. And we pray for, for our brothers and for others who, who don't know the Lord yet, who can't see this as clearly as perhaps some of, we, some of us are today. One of the other things that they would do um, here in recent years is the retelling of the story of Ruth. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of quickly blow past this, but the story of Ruth is all about tragedy, loyalty, loyalty, and then restoration. The tragedy is, is that you have the story beginning with um, Naomi. Naomi is an Israelite, and she and her family, her two sons and her husband, they, f- they come down to Moab because there's a famine in the land and they need food. And as they settle there for a period of time, the sons marry Moabite women. Well, the sons both died. The husband dies. And so now you're left with Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. And in this society, they would have no ownership rights, property rights, or anything. At this point, they are left absolutely destitute because they have, they have no male to cover them. And so Naomi wants to go back to Israel, and she gives an out to her two daughters-in-law saying, look, you're welcome to stay. Don't, don't bother traveling with me because I have nothing for you. You know, go ahead and start a new life. One of them decides to go ahead and do just that. The other is Ruth. Ruth declares to her that where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. She goes with her all the way back to Israel, and they begin, if you read the story carefully, it's the barley harvest season, Feast of First Fruits time frame. They go and they start to pluck and, and work in different fields. And over the course of time, we see the loyalty aspect. The loyalty first is um, Ruth's loyalty to her mother-in-law. And as they go there, they encounter a man named Boaz who owns the field in which they are working. Naomi lets Ruth know that this Boaz is actually one of our family members. He is what they would call their redeemer. So he has the ability, he has, um, he has the, the family lineage, he has the resources. He could, should he desire, redeem them into his family through marriage and also with, with money to redeem them, their property, essentially their whole livelihood. As the story goes on, the two seemingly fall in love, they get married, and what we see then is that just as the loyalty of Ruth was to Naomi, so then the loyalty of Boaz to the family comes to fruition, and we see restoration within this family. Now the Jews would celebrate this story as the providential work of God, because in it, they have a son, a son named Obed, who would be the grandfather of King David. As Christians today, we look at this story and say, yes, we have King David, but also from that family line, we have King Jesus. Not only that, but the book of Hebrews tells us that Christ is our brother. We're going to be celebrating baptisms and those who have been adopted and brought into the family of God. He has called us his brother. The Lord calls us his children. And so when we celebrate Jesus as the kinsman redeemer, we as believers today can look back to the story of Ruth and say Boaz is a type of Christ and that just as Naomi and Ruth had no resources, they had nothing available to them to save themselves, they come under the wing of Boaz who restores and rescues them. And that's essentially what Jesus does for each of us is that we were dead in our sins. We have no resources for which to save ourselves, but he has taken us under his wing. He has purchased us by giving his blood as a price and has taken us and redeemed us into his family. It's amazing. Amazing. So, ultimately, all of these things, all of these feasts point to Jesus. When you start to understand Pentecost in this full cultural context, you start to see all the more just how detailed God was in putting his word together and making all of this come to life. Now, on the 24th, we're going to be having a study that's going to look at all these different feasts. And I'm going to go through each one just about as detailed as I went through this one for you. But I want to give you a snapshot, and I want to pique your interest as to all these different feasts. 
So for just a couple of minutes, if you indulge me, I want to talk about them. And then we're going to celebrate another feast. By the way, any men go to the men's breakfast yesterday? What a feast that was. Yeah. Man, there were slaughtered animals all over everybody's plates. Um, It was a pleasing sacrifice indeed to the Lord. All right. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to briefly touch on each of these feasts, and then I'm going to show you a scripture of how Jesus kind of um, fulfills it in a way, or how the scriptures talk of him fulfilling it. The first feast was Passover. So you might remember in the Old Testament, you had the ten plagues that came upon Egypt. That tenth plague was the, the promise of a death angel that would take the firstborn, not just of human beings, but also of the livestock of the field. And God told the Hebrews that if they were to take the blood of a lamb, he gave them specific instructions, but take the blood of the lamb, put it over the doorpost of your homes, and as the death angel comes through, it will literally pass over you. So that was, that was Passover itself. For year after year following, the Passover would be celebrated as a memorial feast. That feast was to begin on the 14th day of Nisan, which started then what we'll call the sacred year for the Jews. If you know, um, Rosh Hashanah is in September time frame, and that is the Jewish New Year. That is the Jewish calendar New Year. So this would be the beginning of what we'll call a sacred year. And what's so fascinating about Passover is that John looked out and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. One of the other scriptures that we have for you here is found in 1 Peter. So Peter talks about the fulfillment of Jesus being our Passover lamb, and he writes, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things as gold and silver, or silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. One of the other unique things that we find in the Passover season is that the instructions to Moses was that they were to take a lamb from the flock. They were to take a lamb on the 10th day and bring it out of the herd and into the family. They were to keep that lamb for those five days and inspect it to ensure that there was no spot or blemish on this lamb. Why is this so significant? It's significant because while Jesus was there in the city, he was being examined, questioned, and threatened over and over again by the Pharisees, religious uh, rulers, and others. And it wasn't until after the end of his mock trial where he, they bring him to Pontius Pilate, the one who had authority over the land. And what did he say of Jesus? I find no fault in this man. He is our Passover lamb and that he spilled his blood for us so that God's judgment would not befall on us. The second feast begins the day after the 15th of Nisan. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this was uh, an intense time. Unleavened bread is used at Passover as well. But because they had to flee Egypt in haste, they were to make this bread unleavened so it would bake faster, and they were to use it and celebrate it for the continuation of this feast. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread um, is fulfilled in this passage um, In Acts 2.27, we we actually kind of skipped over it. He talks about how you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. And so while Jesus was in the grave for a short while, his body did not decompose the way that some of us would. It would not see corruption. In fact, it would come and be raised to life once again. We're going to talk about this a little more in a second when we celebrate communion, but his body did not see corruption. And though it was in the grave for a short while, It was not destroyed. If you were to bake bread with true leaven, it would permeate, it would puff up, and it would eventually mold. You don't get that with unleavened bread. You can buy a package of matzah and leave it sitting out for months and months, and it won't won't corrupt. Now, the final feast in the springtime is the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Roots was that first harvest season. They would come and gather around, and they would celebrate that harvest season by taking the ephah, and it was, it was a, uh, the barley offering, and they would bring it and with other sacrifices. And what, again, they would have to lift it and wave it before God in their practices. And what does the scripture say of Jesus? That he was lifted from the grave. And most of the scholars who I've been reading are in agreement that these three days 
would just so happen to line up perfectly on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That Friday, we know Jesus suffered and died on the cross, and it would have been a Passover season. He would have been our Passover lamb. The same day they're, they're sacrificing lambs would have been the same day that Jesus himself was sacrificed on the cross. The next day would have been Saturday. It would have been a high holy day because why? You have the beginning now of the feast, uh, the feast of unleavened bread. His body might be in the grave, but it will not see corruption. Because the following day, the day after, which would be the 16th of Nisan, that would be the beginning. It was the day after the Sabbath. So the day after the Sabbath is when you begin the feast of first fruits. And what happened? That was the day on that Sunday, the first day of the week, that we know Jesus to rise from the dead. If Jesus can do all of that in history, and then we come to Pentecost, and then we just spend a lot of time talking about that, and the Spirit of God can come down and overwhelm the believers who are ready to receive it, then the final three feasts that we're going to be looking at are going to be fulfilled in such a unique and remarkable way. Because the first one is the Feast of Trumpets. And at the Feast of Trumpets, they would enunciate the beginning of a new year. They would enunciate the fact that the final harvest season has come to a close. And it was a joyous and festival time. Well, what does the scripture tell us is going to happen at that trumpet sound? Well, let's take a look. This is going to be uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel. And with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. There is going to be a trumpet sound along with the cry of an archangel when Christ returns. And it's going to enunciate for us then the beginning of a new season. Amen? Amen. So, you have this, this incredible feast that's celebrated, and it's a picture of Christ to come. You also have, following that in a few days, the Day of Atonement. This would be 10 days later, and the period of time between these two festivals is what the Jews called the Days of Awe. Interesting point about the Days of Awe is they, they looked at that and saw that their names were either written in God's books favorably, unfavorably, or undecided. And it was during these 10 days between the New Year and the Day of Atonement that they would spend great time in repentance so that God would be favorable to them to give them a new, an, an, another year on this earth. That's an interesting point because why? We know in Scripture that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, when you get to the Day of Atonement, I often call this the story of two goats. Because the Day of Atonement is another day, another festival day. They go to the temple and they have many sacrifices. Uh, the most notable of two would be these two goats. The first goat is a sacrifice. They would kill it and spill its blood on the altar. And the purpose for slaughtering this one goat is that it would make atonement for sin. Atonement means a covering. And that's why year after year they would have to do this over and over again. And if you want to do some fun study on the Day of Atonement, there are so many, um, I'll, I'll say hoops to jump through, if you know what I mean. But there are a lot of details that have to be specifically checked off for this to go successfully. It was the only day that the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. They would literally have a rope tied to his ankles and bells on his dress clothes so that if something should happen to him in the presence of God, they could then take that rope and drag him out. It's pretty, pretty powerful. So you have the atoning sacrifice of the one goat, and then the other goat, they would lay their hands on the goat, they would pray over it the sins of the nation, and send the goat out into the wilderness, out of the city. What did we see that Jesus did? When Jesus came, he, the scripture says, is our final atoning sacrifice. That his blood did for us what we and the slaughter of animals for centuries could not do. He also was led out of the city in which he was later crucified. And the scriptures tell us, and we're going to see this in the Psalms, that he has removed our sins from us. He expiates. That means remove. So not only does the blood of Jesus atone and cover for our sins, but by his life 
for us, he expiates our sin and sends it away from us as far as the east is from the west. So um, here's a couple of scriptures just to prove that point. Uh, Romans 5, 9. Let's back up one. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So he took the wrath of God for us in his body on that cross. And then the next verse, which we just talked about, is that just as you're uh, as far as the east is from the west, so he removes or expiates our transgressions from us. The last feast to be celebrated is going to be on that 15th, uh, the 15th day, and that's the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles, once again, looks back all the way to the Exodus story and how as they wander through the wilderness, they had temporary dwellings. And so they were living in these temporary dwellings. Meanwhile, God also was living in the tabernacle with them. And the scriptures tell us over and over again that um, this idea of dwelling together, tabernacling together, um, it all points back then to this Feast of Tabernacles. Here's a fun, fun fact for you too on this one is that, remember the woman caught in adultery? When she was brought and caught in the act of adultery, they brought her to Jesus so that he could be the one to condemn her. It took place at the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. And for these eight days, they would set up temporary dwellings outside the city, and it became a festive time. And so with that in mind, that cultural context in mind, almost like a, um, you know, like a, trying, like a Woodstock kind of a celebration, you know, you're living in tents outside the city for a number of days, and some people get crazy, some people don't. Um, but you can understand how, how maybe something like this could be happening, or at least set up. And so the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated what was done in the Exodus. The scriptures tell us it also foretells something that's going to take place. So let's take a look real quick in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, he begins, and the Word, that's Jesus, became flesh, and he dwelt. Another translation for that is he tabernacled. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. We have seen his glory. The glory is only of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. At the first advent of Jesus, he tabernacled with men. He's gone back. He is coming again. And what does the book of Revelation now tell us is going to happen as it relates to the Feast of Tabernacles? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. He goes on, and I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place, the tabernacle. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell. He will tabernacle with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is where all of us start to smile and hope, right? He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death shall be no more. Neither shall be there, there, there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. So yes, I get excited teaching this stuff. Um, and I hope that you will come out to our study on uh, this beginning on the 24th to learn more about each of these feasts and festivals and how they point to Christ. Because in the midst of the celebration, there's so much to know and to understand. And the, the reading of the scriptures, as we talk about grow, gather, and go, you have an opportunity to grow all the more through studying the scriptures deeply. Be a Berean. Study the scriptures deeply. And so we're going to celebrate the feast. If you brought communion elements with you, and go ahead and take those out. Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples, and he took... You'll, you'll learn about this, the middle piece, most likely. But he took matzah, and he said to his disciples to take a look at this. This is my body given for you. This 18-minute bread, as they call it. Sometimes they would call it the bread of haste, because in the quickness, they would have to make the bread because they were anticipating their escape from Egypt. They would also call it the bread of affliction. If you were to look at this piece of matzah, you would see these burn marks on here. That affliction is because it would lay on the crate as it was being baked for those 18 minutes in the hot oven. And so when Jesus says, this is my body, he's also reminding them that it's flat. There was no leaven in the unleavened bread. It was completely removed. 
And he's saying to them, I am sinless. And if you were to turn and look, you'll see that it's pierced and it's striped from the baking. And what does Isaiah remind us of? It says that he was pierced for our transgressions and that by his stripes we are healed. And so Jesus gives this powerful symbol to his disciples to say, it's not just a symbol. There's much deeper meaning than just a piece of bread. And he says to them, you take this and you eat to remember me by. Let's take the bread. Now the scriptures say, after the supper, he took a cup. We know from understanding the Seder meal that there were four cups of wine that were used to celebrate that meal. Each cup was a representation of a phrase written in the Exodus account that spoke of the Lord's promise to deliver the people. The third cup, the third cup would be the one taken after the supper, was called the cup of redemption. Because the scriptures say in the Old Testament, I will redeem you. Jesus used that to say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He will redeem you. He also said to them that when you take this, it's the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this to remember me by. He goes on to say, I will not drink of the cup again, pointing to the fourth cup. Does anyone know what the fourth cup is called? The cup of praise. Another translation or synonym for that would be celebration. He said, I'm not going to be drinking that again until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of heaven. So when God comes, when the Lord comes and he gathers his saints, a harvest of souls, he will have something to celebrate. And as we all sit at his table, and perhaps that fourth glass is on the table, we'll think back and we might be reminded that we truly have something to celebrate now as we sit in the presence of our Savior. But it's, there's no time to celebrate just yet, says Jesus. But for right now, remember me. Remember that I have ransomed your soul. And Paul says that we remember him and we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. When you look at these feasts and festivals and you celebrate the giving of the Lord's Supper and the bread and the wine, it is such an opportunity to remember him by, to strengthen your faith and to strengthen your soul, to look forward to the future when those fall harvest feasts surely will come. So let's together take of the cup. We're going to take a moment to reflect before we have an opportunity for for baptisms. Perhaps the Lord has stirred your heart. Perhaps you've been resistant. You've been an old wineskin, unready to receive the gifts that the Lord wants to give you. This can be an opportunity for you to put faith in him, to ask God to make you a new creation, to make you a new wineskin, so to speak, so that he truly can pour into you the new wine, the wine of God's blessing, his security, his love, and his grace over your life but you're only going to be ready to receive it if, in fact, we're new creations in him. Otherwise, it's just going to spill right out. So let's take a moment to pray, and we'll invite for those of you who might want to be baptized today. The water is available. Come and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin in Jesus. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time and opportunity. We look forward, God, to um, celebrating these different feasts and festivals through study. We look, we, we've celebrated today, God, your body and blood poured out for us and that you are sinless, you are perfect. You have redeemed us at a great cost. And we would pray, God, that um, you would just continue as the days move forward to open our eyes more and more to how you are working in and through all things. God, we lift up this sermon series to you as we talk about just being ignited, that you would put a passion in our souls to to be hungry for your word, that you would continue to make us into those uh, vessels willing to receive and to hold your Holy Spirit's outpouring that we know that you want to give to us. Uh, We pray for our church as we continue to move forward in these days. We lift this to you in the name of Jesus, our our Savior. 
in whose name we all pray. Amen. Amen. Let's reflect and sing together. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness the home that himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah Name above all names Blessed Redeemer Emmanuel The rescue for sinners the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken in poured out. Love so amazing. It's love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names. Blessed Redeemer. Messiah, Lord of all. You know, it doesn't matter how many times that I read scripture or hear a sermon, it is just so incredible how all of the pieces of scripture fit together. It can seem like a random collection of different stories, but it's not. It is a constant theme of God making promises and fulfilling those promises in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the Bible that we read. That's, that's so incredible. Well, this morning, we want to give an opportunity for anyone in the room who feels a stir to be baptized. We believe that baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. God has done something inside of you, and you want to let everyone know, I am born again. I'm a born-again believer of Jesus Christ. If that's you today, I just want to give an opportunity. Andrew Patterson, right over here. Andrew, Andrew if you'll put your hand up, is right over here. We're going to jump back into the song for just a couple, couple minutes, and if you want to be baptized this morning. I know this is a bit impromptu, but it's all right. If you feel the stirring, head right over there to Andrew, and we will uh, do baptisms this morning, and we're just going to worship together for a couple more minutes. All I hope is in you. All I hope is in you all glory to you God the light of the world all I hope is in you all I hope is in you Jesus, my 
tonight. But as you go out this morning, I want to give you two invitations. Number one, please come join us on the 24th. I think that this is going to be such a powerful and impactful study as we dig into, you know, God didn't do anything by mistake. He was very strategic in everything he did, and it opens up the text to us, as I hope you saw today. And the second invitation is come join us tonight for prayer at 6 o'clock. Come expectant. The Lord has laid something on my heart that I'd like to share as we continue to move in this season of expecting the Holy Spirit to show up in big ways. I stand firm on the belief that our world needs revival. Our world needs a touch from the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're contending for. Come pray with us and come expectant for God to show up in a big way. Let me bless you this this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for every single member in this room today. I thank you that we have open hearts to receive you as you will present yourself. And I thank you that we are open to, to learning how the Bible comes alive as we read it from cover to cover, understanding how you wove a perfect story, that story revealing the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you so much for all that you're doing in our lives. And I pray that as we go, that these words would stick with us, they would empower us, and they would equip us to change the world as we announce the kingdom of Jesus Christ is here. Our Lord is on the throne. Lord, I pray that you would be with each person, bring them blessings so they can be a blessing. I thank you so much. In Jesus' precious name, everyone said, amen, amen. Have a good week.